Greetings and salutations, everyone. Today we're going to take a look at the Roaring Twenties in America, the business culture that was created and a decade of decadence and indulgence that really was a change from everything we've seen before. So let's get started. The business of America by the 20s is business. After World War I, our big industries really aren't going to be making the same kind of profit they used to in manufacturing. Railroads are going to start to be replaced by cars. Mining for ore and lumber are not in the same kind of demand. Coal is being replaced with steam and regular electricity. The amount of new homes being built is going down. And if you're in any of these professions, you're going to see a downward tick in your workload, which is going to lead to less take home. The amount of stuff that's available after the war really does go through the roof. And this new stuff is marketed by salespeople, by advertisers, saying this is the new it thing. And people are buying these new it things. Like how every year there's the new smartphone. It launches onto the market and you must get the brand new one. It doesn't matter if your old one is only a year old. You might as well throw it away. That's their idea. And that idea starts here. We see that sports had moved from this frivolous thing that keep people entertained to being a real occupation. The idea that physical fitness was an important attribute comes into existence during this time. Bicycling had existed a century before this, but it becomes a sport and a fad now. The idea of going out and entertaining oneself in new ways was new. Spectator sports are transforming. Sports that you do not play, you just go and enjoy. Horse racing used to be, well, they called it the sport of kings. It was an upper class, rich person sport. But over time, the tracks get bigger. They can hold more people. People get involved. They start betting on the horse they want to win. And it's more open to more people. Boxing originally was for the rich. But more and more people are going to want to get in on the fun. They want to be there and see not some rich snob try to fight. You want to see a young factory worker guy go in there and show what he can do. Baseball existed from the 1840s, starts getting more popular during the Civil War, and afterwards we see our professional teams are going to show up. 1876. The National League appears. About two and a half decades later, we've got the American League, and the first World Series follows shortly thereafter. Basketball, a creation by James Naismith, was a simple enough goal for the YMCA. It was a real simple sport, and it was called basketball because you know you shot the, ba the ball into baskets that were on the top of poles, and it wasn't until one day that the ball went through a basket and the bottom fell out of the basket that, you know, everyone realized, oh my god, I don't have to climb a ladder and get the basket down anymore. This is, this is awesome. Football. I mean, this started out originally as rugby and started out where, well, it was very different than the game we understand now. The original game of football was passing and a lot more tackling and usually a lot more broken bones. It was much more brutal. The motion picture camera came into existence in the 19th century thanks to Edison, but motion picture movies start popping up at the dawn of the 20th. Most of these films are really short. They start with a little cartoon, a little bit of world news, then you've got your main movie, which is about 20 minutes long. It's usually a melodrama. And then you've got another cartoon, and then it's over. Radio was much more popular than movies because it was a lot more available. During World War I, 
radio had to be really strictly regulated because you didn't want somebody uh, getting on and staying, okay, we're moving the third infantry unit north and anyone hear it. After the war though, the control over radio comes to an end and to make sure that radio works the way that the government wants it to, the FCC, the Federal Commission of the FCC is created. In 1920, the Women's Suffrage Amendment happens. All women over the age of 21 who are citizens can vote. And the idea starts to move in a larger direction, the idea of an Equal Rights Amendment, a national amendment that said that all citizens are to be treated equally under the law, no special preference for one over the other. The thing that starts to change about how people viewed this is, well, things are changing. Specifically, more people moving to cities and new ideas of what sexuality is. The old ideas start to disappear. And what we think with 21st century sexual culture kind of actually comes into existence during this time. There's homosexuals who, for a hundred years earlier, would be arrested and horrible things happen if they were caught engaging in that act. But by the 20s, they start developing signals, a uh, fashion sign, something that, unless you're part of the community, you might not understand why does that person have a handkerchief in their pocket. You'd have women who would dress like this woman portrayed here, the flapper girl, a respectable woman who would smoke and wear bright lipstick, who would cut their hair short and wear perfume. Now, this is just a Halloween costume now, but in the 20s, if a woman dressed like this in some cities, she would be arrested for nudity. The idea of the family unit even starts to change at this time. Uh, couples are going to start marrying later. They start marrying because they love each other. They're physically attracted to each other. That person I want to marry is in a good social position. They are going to marry and have less kids. These are creations of the industrial world. These are creations of the, these are things that started in the 19th century, but a generation later, this is the impact of it all. The idea of the family infrastructure is changing as well. It is no longer dad holds total autonomy and the family just does what he says. It is considered almost a democracy. Mom and dad work together. The housework, the child care is done together. And from the 20s and onward, divorce is actually made a lot easier for couples, especially if they don't have kids. When we think of the idea of childhood, this is an idea that again comes from the 20s. The idea that a child has certain developmental stages they need to go through happens during this time. Prior to this, that child is just a, a small adult. And we see that one of the big ideas that comes out of quote unquote scientific child rearing is the idea of how you raise your child. Do you raise them real harsh? Are you more stick than carrot or are you more permissive are you willing to let them make some mistakes and learn from those mistakes those are child rearing questions that we've been asking for the past century and there's still no clear answer people who had run off to join the first war the young folk who had run off to join the first war they come back and they find that the way their parents and grandparents had been doing things, they now found reason to laugh at. They wanted to do something different. They wanted to express themselves in new ways. Uh, dating starts being transformed. It used to be that the young man would go to the young woman's house and dating would happen in the presence of the girl's parents and it would happen inside their home. And with new developments of technology, like cars, with new attitudes 
of these old ways are defunct, people start leaving the house to go date. And that man who takes the girl out is going to take care of that girl. This is the idea, this is where we get the concept that when a man takes a woman out, he pays for everything. He takes care of getting her from A to B. The temperance movements of the late 1890s were geared towards ending alcohol, ending drinking, ending booze in this country. And the 18th Amendment would do that. The fear was that the, you could, during this time, make booze at home. You, had, you didn't have to have any oversight, and that led to people making some hooch that really could get you drunk real fast, but would also have the potential to leave you blind. There's a lot of reasons that led to the 18th Amendment being passed, but the 18th Amendment was the Prohibition Amendment. This said that from this point forward, you legally could not own, make, sell, or distribute alcohol. And there were immediately pushbacks to this. Uh, if you wanted a drink, if you had been used to doing this, we see that there was always an infrastructure willing to get that to you. The mob, bootleggers, the individuals who knew how to make booze aren't going to stop just because there's now a law. I mean, think of all the laws people break every day that, hey, there's a law for that, but people break it anyways. The only real way people are going to legally drink anymore is at communion for, well, for religious imbibing. And we see that the number of people who are doing that jumped by 800,000 gallons. It was wild. The president who starts the 20s out is this man, Warren Harding. He was a Republican. He... He is not the most clever, not the most clear-cut guys. He is known for public speaking and letters that were more just blunt, and here's what I mean. He was hardworking. He knew how to work this system, but he was indecisive. He would dither a lot, and when he came to power he started immediately giving away jobs specifically official jobs cabinet jobs to those people it, he had been loyal to back in ohio and it looked like from the outside harding didn't even like being president he just liked all the attention it got him the big thing that the harding era was known for was the scandals um one of his guys from Ohio was an influence peddler. He'd find something salacious out about a person, blackmail them, and then that would be how he would make money and rose to power. Uh, when he was ultimately exposed in 1923, Smith hung himself. Charles Forbes was put in charge of the Veterans Bureau, and we know that he moved money from the, v the Veterans Bureau into his own pockets money that was originally designed to build hospitals the hospitals aren't built or if they're built instead of having a hundred rooms it has 30 rooms and during world war one we see that there were soldiers who did take some stuff from the germans did take them some stuff even from the french and harry daughtry was responsible for making sure that anything stolen was returned to its rightful people. Um, however, again, the, the best stuff managed somehow never to make its way onto the train, but did make its way to his house. And then there's the Teapot Dome scandal, which might have gone right up to Harding himself, where the strategic oil reserve for the Navy was siphoned off and then sold on the cheap. During the 20s, 
with all this reaction against the old ways, we see that there is a new transformation of religious fundamentalism. The idea that you need a strong conservative hand to guide what the society is doing. And one of the ways that religious fundamentalism came in full swing was attacking evolution. The Scopes Monkey Trial was the trial in which case society, well, Tennessee, put on, put evolution to question. And there's another video in this lineup that goes into this in much more detail. Ultimately, though, the Scopes Monkey Trial was all about how the state wanted to view what was morally right. And that's all this information here. I, like I said, I'm going to skip this in this, this one. I'd highly encourage go check out the other video in this playlist or just pause the screen here. The Klan came back and they were essentially gone at, in the mid 1870s. But in 1915, they came back and they came back in a big way. They went after the same groups that they had always gone after. And the Klan had groups for men, groups for women, groups in different states that in some cases were high ranking members of the state, Indiana, Oklahoma, Texas. That was just wild. They start falling apart in the 1920s because of infighting. And then they fade back into obscurity, thank goodness. After World War I, there was a huge flood of immigrants who wanted to come to the United States to escape war-torn Europe. And in 1921, Congress reacts to this by passing a quota system that said the number of foreign-born residents that could enter the United States was 3% of what the population was in 1910. So you've got some crazy math to figure out there. But in the end, there were still more immigrants coming here than people felt comfortable with being here. So in 1924, the quota is changed. They took what was the American population in 1890. They took 2% of whatever that number was. And that was the number of people who were allowed to come in and legally stay in the United States. All these new native, uh, immigrants coming in were seen as a threat to the American freedom, a threat to the American experience. And laws get passed to enforce the idea of Americanization. The 20s also see a big boom for African-American art and culture. And Harlem is where it's happening at. Harlem was a part of New York that was, well, cheap to live in and attractive to minority groups, people from the West Indies. And the art, the style, the music that comes out of here really is going to be a game changer. One of our influential um, early civil rights movements during this time is Marcus Garvey, and that's him depicted there. He believed in the idea of black separatism, that it was not right for white Americans and black Americans to live together. And Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association said that they would help get people back to Africa if, if they wanted to. And that is where we're going to end it. This slide actually goes with our next uh, bit of information. So I'm going to go ahead and kill it here. Today we took a look at how the 20s came to be and what shaped everything from here and beyond. So hope you learned something. I'll see you next time.